a lot of people interested in property investment. And so I thought I'd make a quick video on the 10 most common mistakes that property investors make. And this is not in any particular order, but I'll just go and list out. The first one is inadequate research. And by that, I mean people tend to jump in without doing any kind of market research in the area that they're in. So if you're thinking about buying a particular in, in a particular area, it's always a good idea to go around and look at all the prices of the existing properties. You can find out uh, so much information online these days. You can find out prices that have been paid in the past. You can find out what people are renting. There's various rental portals. You go on those things and you can pick up a whole lot of information about what does it cost to rent a whole house? What does it cost in that area to rent, say, on a room by room basis? What's the difference between a room with an ensuite and a room without? All of that information is really valuable. Also, break down the amount that you're paying. If you're looking at a property and it's, say, 250,000, what does that break down in terms of the square footage area of the property? How much are you paying per square meter? This allows you to compare easily with other properties. Now, it's always important to know the difference between is this a three bed, is this a four bed, and look for the distinction between, say, a detached house versus a semi-detached house versus a terrace house. Uh, also, little things make a difference. You should always walk the streets in an area and just get a flavor or a feel for it. They always say you should invest in an area where you're familiar with because at least then you have local knowledge and that's one of the key things. So the next one is neglecting to plan for the financial realities of owning this property. So a lot of people will look at, say, their, their mortgage payments and they'll say, right, if I borrow this amount of money, I'm going to be making these financial payments. I'm going to be collecting this amount of rent and so there's a nice little margin and I can keep that. The problem is there's all sorts of hidden costs to property. There is the cost of just maintaining the property. Let's say for example a tenant moves in and no sooner are they in that the dishwasher is broken or something like that. You're going to have to go and fix that and that might require a replacement so there's 500 gone on and replacing that. But there's also lots of little things that can happen over time. You know, there's decorating expenses, there's furniture renewal, all that kind of stuff. Then in addition to that, you've got the repairs that can happen for um, storm damage, trees, all that. You will need to make sure that there's a healthy enough margin between the mortgage and the rent that you're getting, that there's enough there just to cover things like insurance, there's tax. Make sure that when you're buying a property, that you have a fairly significant margin there uh, and it's a cash flow margin like you want to have a positive cash flowing property but people buy in certain areas and it's a very very low yield property i mean if you're buying in a sort of a popular part of a capital city like dublin you'll be looking at four or five percent yield on that property whereas if you buy in the countryside in say a town or something like that you might be able to pick that property up at a 15 to 20 percent yield which will mean that you have got your mortgage payments uh, you've got at least three times the amount of income coming in than your mortgage payment versus having a mortgage payment that only just is cleared by the rent the next one is tenants are you doing adequate due diligence on your tenant. A lot of people ignore this and that's a massive mistake. I remember when I started investing in property, I was keen to get it rented as quickly as possible because you, you've obviously, you've paid out for the property, you wanna start collecting an income as quickly as possible. Uh, but I didn't pay a huge amount of attention to the tenant and then sure enough, you end up with problems. You, you can have a tenant who's just a nuisance, you can have a tenant that bothers everyone else who might be renting the property, and maybe they play loud music at night or whatever. What you wanna do is a little bit of background checking into the person. First of all, do they have the finances to pay the rent? Second of all, do they have a steady job? Third, do they have a bad history with other landlords? Now, one of the little tips is do not ask an existing landlord for a reference. Well, get a reference from them by all means, but don't rely exclusively on your existing landlord reference because if a tenant is a problem tenant, and that they ask for a reference letter, the, the landlord will give them a good reference letter just to get rid of them. So they're not gonna say this guy's a nightmare because they know then they'll be stuck in their property. Ask from the previous landlord to the one that the person may currently be with. Don't even ask for a reference letter, 
re get, get the details of the previous landlord and reach out to that person so that you can get a conversation on the phone with them and actually understand, is this a person that they would bring back, that they would allow back into their property? One of the next things I'm gonna talk about is lack of diversification. Now, what do I mean by that? When you're investing in property, uh, when you're starting out, obviously you don't have the resources to go off and buy multiple properties. It means that if you buy a property and if you have a single tenant in the property, let's say you buy a three bedroom house and you rent it to a family. So that family is paying you the rent. If the husband or the wife stops earning, they're gonna stop being able to afford the rent and it's very hard to kick a family out on the street. So you're gonna be there stuck with a situation where this one tenant is the single point of failure. And if they stop paying rent, you are really in trouble because you have a mortgage to pay every month. You've got other obligations to make and this person has stopped paying now. Compare that with say, if you buy the same three bedroom, bedroom house, but you rent it to say three different, four different tenants and they each live in a room. Now, instead of having a single point of failure, you have got four different tenants. And so you've spread your risk slightly. For, you know, one tenant to stop paying, you still have three others that will continue to pay. As you grow a portfolio, you buy one property, you go and buy a second one, you buy a third one. Every time you do that, you're reducing the risk of there being that single tenant that kind of stops paying you rent and takes you down. Next thing I want to talk about is emotional decisions when it comes to buying or selling a property. This is one of the biggest things because I found over the years that you can, you can get emotionally attached to the idea of buying or selling a property. And you can decide that, well, I absolutely love this area. You might start envisioning yourself living in this area. All of that stuff is an emotional baggage. And what that is going to do, it's going to create this cognitive bias. You're looking for reasons to confirm that this is a great buy. And that is because you've fallen in love with the property and you're no longer objective about it. You're looking for something that will say, yes, this is a fantastic area to invest rather than having an open mind and saying, if a piece of information comes in and says, this is a terrible investment, you'd listen to it. Whereas when you have confirmation bias, a piece of information that says this is not a good area might just kind of get moved to the side and you start to ignore that information and you're looking for something else that is more positive. Another big, big mistake is over leverage. And that is when people try to buy property that is beyond their means, okay? so. We all have to save up a deposit to go and buy a property. And then you go and you borrow the maximum you can. That's the typical way. So if you're going out to buy a property, you'll find a property. And if you can get away with a 10% deposit and borrow 90%, that's what you'll do. But a lot of banks, when it comes to investors, they would prefer you to put down say 30% and borrow 70. Now, it's obviously more difficult to come up with that 30%, but that will mean that you have a less leveraged deal. If you go to the 90%, it doesn't take much for that deal to actually fall off uh, and, and become a liability for you. The next one is property management. Okay. Property management is an area that people tend to overlook. And what I've seen in the past is that you kind of think that sure the tenant is going to move in and that's going to be all I need to worry about. It's not always that easy. Like the property management, there are aspects. First of all, you've got to register the property with the various authorities and stuff like that. A good idea is to create what I call a sinking fund. And that is where you have like a separate bank account. And every month, if you get a thousand euro in, you chip a hundred into the sinking fund and that will build up over time. And then when you do have these incidentals that happen, like a broken washing machine or whatever, you can just dip in to the sinking fund. You're not going to have to dip into your own pocket to do that. And this is just, a, it's a good discipline to get into. Uh, ignoring legal and tax implications. Tax obviously is something that you need to be careful about. You have to pay property tax. You have to pay uh, tax on your surplus income and things like that. That's obviously something. There is also the legal side. You've got zoning and you've got planning and a lot of people will often put on an extension to a house and they'll add on something. They can, that can actually create a problem when you're going to sell the property at a later date. If you have put on, we'll say an extension that is not exempted, when you come to selling the property, you know, the bank will be appointing a valuer. The valuer will go look around, they'll see the extension, 
they'll have a look at the planning file to see does it have planning and when they find that it doesn't have planning quite often the banks will reject the application on the basis of that issue unless it's regularized failure to plan for the long term and a lot of people they kind of look short term they're thinking okay i'm making this extra money every month it's nice to have this extra few quid but the reality is that over time properties require maintenance and i mentioned earlier the sinking fund you can find that over a long period of time let's say you hold on to a property for 15 years which is actually i've held on to a property and i've had the same tenant for 19 years and the pe tenant paid rent, never had a day's problem. 19 years later, I sold the property and the tenant left as a result of that sale. But that was it. 19 years were the same. That time just flew by because there was no issue and no hassle with that tenant. If you are holding on to a property long term like that, there comes a point where the tenant is moving out, we'll say, and you now have to go in and you have to update the property. That can be a costly exercise. You might need to re-carpet the house, you might need to repaint the house, you might need to put in new bathrooms, new kitchen, uh, new furniture. You can find yourself out of pocket quite a substantial amount. And the problem is, is if the income has stopped, then all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where the income has run out and you have this big expense to pay. So planning long term, that's where the sinking fund really comes in handy. You can have a little war chest there with 20,000 in it or something like that. It's just been building up slowly over time. The final one is professional advice. If you're going to go and buy a property, it's really important to appoint a surveyor, building surveyor, to go and have a look at stuff that you had no idea was problematic. And for example, asbestos. Older properties often had asbestos ceiling tiles Asbestos is a carcinogen, so it can create cancer in people. You, as the owner, are obligated to have it removed professionally and all that. Now, what if you didn't know about this and you bought the property and next minute you discovered that this is an issue? Other things you might find, you go to the back of the property, you look, you see a crack running up through the house. That's a structural uh, issue and you might need to get a structural engineer to look at it. And also, there could be things like the electrical system is no longer safe. You could have the plumbing system. You might have old lead pipes that are no longer health, uh, healthy and safe. And all of this little stuff makes such a difference. Now, the problem is, is that these guys, they cost money. But if you're going to seriously go after this property, it is absolutely essential that you know what you're paying for. And certainly you will buy a property. Let's say you're successful with a bid and you offer a certain amount and you're successful. Always make it that that bid is subject to survey and condition report. And at least that way you have the out if it comes back with some major problem that you had no idea about. Guys, I hope you found this one useful. Speak to you in the next video.